It's a huge pleasure to be with you. Uh, I was very warmly welcomed into your family and one of your homes in Budapest last year. So it's a great pleasure to come back to the family, but also to welcome you to my home, because although we've got it all set up here uh, at super quick speed to be able to deliver for everybody, uh, you are in my home today and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here. Um, this intense uh, but short period in history that we are currently uh, navigating will end. It will end. But how we supported each other, how we led, uh, who we gave uh, encouragement to, who we cut some slack when they needed a little bit of space and they needed to be uh, understood, uh, that will live on. Uh, and they will tell stories about uh, how we led during this time. So we have a short intense window to ensure that we show up and step up in order to build the legacy and the reputation as leaders that we wish to look back on during this time. And what I would like to do today is just to, to give us a pause as, uh, as we understand that our communities are watching us, our people are watching us, for many of us now, our children are watching us and learning how we show up to work, how we show up for other people and how we show up when things aren't as easy as they have been in the past. So a pause for reflection as we recognize that today in order to uh, really just stop. I'll try and generate some ideas. I'm aware there is a vastly experienced group uh, on the call today, but I'll throw in some ideas uh, and ask some questions just to give a pause for reflection. Are we doing things the way we want to? And to do that, I'm going to draw upon uh, 10 years of working with senior leaders and senior leadership teams to deliver change. You might be thinking, uh, those of you not in Budapest, what has the free diving horse racing guy got to do with this? I'll, I'll touch on that. It's all about extreme change. So I'll draw on that experience of working with senior leaders over the last decade to, to go through uncertainty and deliver change through disruption. But also, drawing on the last 20 days, because we've all learned uh, a decade's worth of <laughs> leadership understanding in the last uh, 20 days. And I have the huge privilege of being able to be on calls with uh, people like Simon and Franco and, and, and colleagues uh, 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 at a similar level in different industries, different companies. And I'll bring some of that into the call today as well. So drawing on those two areas to create that provocation, as I said, I'm going to start by looking at what change means, what disruption does to the team. Some of them familiar, but much to Budapest people, but I think it's important for everybody that we go back there. Because only when we understand what our people are going through in uncertainty and risk and disruption, can we then understand how to serve them and bring them together so that we can move forward to deliver something really special. And that idea of uplifting lives, so uh, present, really present in Budapest. And in my travels, uh, after meeting so many of you in that beautiful building, uh, I would appear in different Corinthian hotels around the world. I would always check in um, uh, with, a, with a bit of a, a hand movement and see what the receptionist did back. And they would just say, who are you? Who are you? So, so if I'm going to live on this call as well, it was uh, really important what we'll speak about. So we'll speak about what it's like going through change. We'll speak about how we can support people going through that, uh, the two sides of the coin that we'll have to understand if we're going to support our people. Uh, then we'll do action planning all the way through. I'll be inviting you to think, so what do I need to do about this? So that this is not a, a me advising you because you have uh, way more experience uh, in your roles and your people than I could e ever hope to um, uh, achieve. What, what it will be about is me prompting you to ask yourself the, some, some really important questions uh, as we devote this time together. I want to start by uh, the idea that uh, change, uh, and we're going through a change, uh, is, is simple. And of course, for any consultant, I'm uh, not, uh, who's uh, engaged and paid for delivering change or any academic, they're generally, with the greatest of respect, paid to make it complex and to show you how complex it is. Uh, for those of us who have to work with teams to deliver it, our job is to assist the simplification of this process. So let's take change to a really simple place. Change means asking people to do a new thing, think differently and act differently. 
That's all we're trying to do. And a big, even a big organizational change is just that, but on a cellular level, many hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people do it, thinking a new way uh, and doing a new thing. And that's challenging, but it's relatively simple. And when the um, human being is asked to do a new thing, they have a problem. There's risk and there's uncertainty. And of course, we're asking people to do new things. They have risk, they have uncertainty, real uncertainty now because we cannot predict the future. We never could, but we pretended we could. Now we know that we cannot in the near term. So when we go into that situation, uh, we're going to face risk and uncertainty. So I can't see you, but I'm going to ask you just to raise your hands quietly in your own minds. Those of you who were educated at school, who had a mother or a father who would wave you off to school in the morning and say, bye bye, my darling. Have a wonderful day today. Be sure and take a risk at school today. Make sure that uh, you don't fear uncertainty. Don't worry if you're not sure about the answer. Just walk out into the middle and have a go. When we talked about this in Budapest, I want to come back to it today because we were not raised for risk and uncertainty. We were raised, ladies and gents, for the industrial age. We were raised for a time when it was our job to get it right first time to the satisfaction of a big person, the authority figure who knew what right looked like. So our whole job was to second guess what the boss wanted and to deliver certainty back uh, in that environment. And of course, to prepare us for that, they sent us off to school. So we, we were, we, in those days for the industrial age, we were educated in this format. Now, of course, we're not living in that age. We're living in a different age entirely. This uh, agile, fast moving, connected, digital age where we're pushing responsibility down uh, to a, a front of house member of staff or a, or a person who's meeting the customer in, in uh, looking after their room uh, in the morning. And we're asking them to own uplifting lives and to own acting with, with, with heart, head and hands in that moment. And of course, to do that, we've, we're educating our children entirely differently now. We're not at all, are we? We're educating them exactly the same way. So we have this challenge in that we've been produced uh, to, to act and to thrive in that, at that age of the industrial age. Now, again, we saw this in Budapest. Let's come back to it here. Then we'll move on to the other side of the coin, how we lead this. Would you agree that the rate of change we're seeing in the world around us, now accelerated rapidly uh, by the current situation, is greater than the human being's ability to adapt to a new environment? or to create a new environment if we're going to lead that situation. And we fill this gap with, well, we've got anxiety trouble at work. I'll return to anxiety. We've got well-being issues. People resist change, we say. We never help them understand what change is, usually. But people resist change and they fear change. So we're going to have to, I believe, close this gap with skills, with education, with understanding. For our people and for us as leaders a new way of approaching things so that we can support people to go through this change so the old levers are dead the old methodology is dead the old system is dead the industrial age is dead uh, and that was very much front of mind uh, in the uh, conversation in budapest which i know have been going on for since 2018 uh, and the um the 50-year anniversary and the introduction of uplifting lives and the pushing of decisions further down um to um the ladies and gentlemen at the sharp end. When we have risk and uncertainty, we move from purpose to process. Now, bear with me. We humans uniquely in the whole of the universe, so far as we know, are able to have a goal, an objective, to want to deliver a contribution to leave a legacy. Only us. But we also have in common with the house fly and the toad and the frog, we have a process, a limbic system, which overrides purpose, which takes over our emotional system in times of uncertainty and risk. And we can even hear our journalists now loving this. We can hear their own process as they speak on the, on the uh, magazine programs around the world. We can hear their own process coming out as they try and create more worry and concern rather than moving towards purpose, action and delivering ourselves through this intelligently and carefully. So now more than ever, we're seeing this 
human ability to have purpose, but we get pulled back into process. And again, if we're going to lead people through uncertainty and change, we're going to have to understand this. And it's very important that we recognize that our process is a wonderful evolutionary bonus, a tremendous system. It, it, it directs our attention to a problem. But what we as leaders must be able to do is to override that and think about how do we wish to respond. So anxiety, hugely positive. It directs our attention. But then we must either act or discount. We cannot just keep the anxiety revving by living in process and not acting or discounting. And again, we're going to help our people uh, to understand that. So there are two ways of influencing human behavior, which is all that leaders do, influence human behavior. One, manipulation. If, I, if, I, if you do this, I will make your life better. But if you do that, I'll make your life a little bit more uncomfortable. And indeed, if we get to the stage where we fire you, you're, you could be in really high risk, especially, of course, back in the industrial age. That's manipulation. Inspiration is where we help people see a purpose. We're not cleaning bedrooms, we're uplifting lives. We're changing people's lives. We help people see a purpose. We give them an environment within which they matter and can contribute. And then we help them challenge their idea that says people like me can't, can't add to this great um, mission that we're on. I'm, I, I have to know my place. We say, no, you can come forward. We will trust you and support you. We value your contribution. We either manipulate or we inspire in order to change behavior. I want to go to a few pillars now of how we inspire. And the first, I'll start with a, a story to bring in the first uh, pillar, the first idea. When I gave my first, one of my first presentations, this is not it. It was, it was poor. It, it went very badly. And I knew it was going very badly. It was in Dublin. It was my first time working in Dublin, but all my family has come from Ireland. So I was very proud to be going back to Dublin and I was messing up on stage. Uh, and I knew at the end, I got a polite round of applause. I knew it had gone wrong. And I found myself shortly after that in the gentleman's uh, bathroom and uh, uh, an old wise Irish man who was in the audience came and stood beside me at the, to, as we were washing our hands. And he said, um, congratulations, well done. Thank you for the presentation. I said, thank you very much, but I don't think it went very well. He said, no, it, it didn't go very well. He said, if you'll excuse me, I could tell you why. I said, oh, please. He said, you didn't get you on their side. I said, oh, oh I think you mean I didn't get them on my side. He said, no, you're doing it again. You didn't get you on their side. And because you weren't on their side, you were trying to be on your side and be the great speaker. You didn't pull them with you at any stage. And now I find that having learned that lesson, I can pitch up wherever I wish and open a presentation. And as long as I get me on their side, we can have a great time together. I can make mistakes. They don't mind. I'm on their side. I can speak to a chief executive now in the most extraordinary tones when I'm coaching uh, anyone in the leadership team, say, and they will accept it because they know it's coming from a place of being on their side. And if you think of all the movies you've ever seen in Budapest, we talk about the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy needs someone on her side. And she's got Glinda, the good witch of the South. Luke Skywalker's Obi-Wan Perseus when he goes to slay the Gorgon, Medusa has got Athena giving him an invisibility hat, which uh, Harry Potter then got to borrow as a cloak. We've always needed someone on our side if we're going to go and do things we haven't done before, face uncertainty and risk. Ladies and gents, do they know that you are on their side? If we look at any of the great speakers, the people who, not speakers, people who have inspired us, there was never any doubt that they were on our side. They wanted better for us. And they showed that. They showed that. And even when Steve Jobs was 
showing his here's to the crazy ones think different advertisements or his 1984 there's big jobs apple chiat day advertisements that changed uh, the face of computing maybe advertising they were all about saying i'm on your side you can be like these people and we will support you with the tools to do that so ladies and gentlemen are your people certain that you were on their side one of the ways that you can tell is by uh, listening and when you listen to your people sometimes they will tell you what you want to hear in their opinion and sometimes they will be telling you what they really need to tell you and that will be an indication am i perceived as do they believe that i am on their side or do they see me as the authority figure who is marking their homework back from school ready for the industrial age waiting for me to pull the levers and they'll do what they have to do and be expecting to be manipulated from there in order to move forward so here's another example so i recently would know them that uh, they, they produce a number of brands that we all use in our homes uh, and uh, he was speaking about some of the immediate things that have been done and I, I could use Corinthian examples too but I shan't I'll, I'll go somewhere else if uh, one of the things that he said is we've we've abolished working hours nobody has to be at their desk at any point in time everybody has to achieve their tasks everybody we still got to hit our numbers but nobody has to be at their desk at any moment of time we wanted to show them we understood that they had their children at home that they now had to uh, cook their lunch because they couldn't go to the canteen uh, that there were different things having to be juggled that they might be caring for older relatives who potentially even could be unwell so it's demonstrating how are we on their side pillar two then let's uh, people in budapest you uh, may remember this uh, anybody else i'll give you a quick introduction so that we can um, understand this diagram together but here's a, a map of how we take decisions uh, and let's imagine that there's some uncertainty and risk coming in so the free diving and the horse racing those were me trying to understand deeply what is it like to go through the emotional change that comes with uncertainty and risk change doing new things in order that i can come back and better support leaders to help their people Go through that process and do the uh, sessions like we did in budapest where we help everybody understand so a challenge comes in do a take the british free diving record 100 meters you're going to do it in eight months i set that challenge for myself that hits my beliefs my rules about the world my map of how the world work which is different to the real country the the ground it's just the map but I have a map and I was terrible at sport at school. So my map says, you can't do this. Nobody could do this. This is crazy. This makes me think when we are faced with uncertainty and risk, the human system, we don't like it. So we create the future in our imaginations and then we worry about it. This is very useful because it keeps us safe. If we can either act or discount, if we just keep worrying, it's not so useful. So we have to be able to control this amazing gift. This thinking will now affect my emotions. It's designed to do that because that takes my attention. Now I have to be able to control this. So we'll return to that control, purpose, process in just a moment. But for now, let's look at how important this is, the map. Because the belief, I'm terrible at sport, I can't do this, versus, well, it's only holding your breath and learning how to manage pressure. How hard can it be? That will dictate the thinking and the emotional response. You have a huge impact on this and you can change it in a phone call. You can change it in a moment of understanding another person and listening to what they really need to say to you. So you can change it by being on their side. So how can we shift the beliefs of our people? What is it that they can concerned about and what is the root of that concern we may not be able to address it we may be able to hear it and acknowledge that we're working on it so how can we shift that belief system now of course we, we looked in budapest and i'll touch on it now that will drive our decision either we can override this let's think of us as leaders now we can override this system control it calm it and decide to move to do new things 
take some advice, get somebody on side, gather a mentor and a coach and deliver the results, or we will head the other way. We'll do what we've always done. We'll try and keep safe. And of course, in a world that's changing at this speed, whilst we're at this speed, that isn't safe. We need to be elevating up. So how can we help people come around this side through encouraging this change in beliefs? So my second principle to you, one, get on their side, two, and let them know you're on their side, two, is how can we begin to challenge the map? There's been a lot of map about how the world will never come back to normal. Now, we can't predict the future, but, but let's just, let's, we, can, we can have an equally um, uh, realistic assessment of the future that says in time, people will come out and they will want places to get married and to do business and to all the wonderful things uh, that we used to do. So how can we help shape people's beliefs uh, about the future uh, in order that they can control uh, this process that moves on from there? Now, when I was young, we were, we were very poor. We, we, we came to um, England uh, as a family from Ireland and um, my parents uh, came over as then as immigrants and um, they set up a life in the UK and there was absolutely no money really till we were maybe 13, 15. And, uh, but we had um, some, some games in the house, which we used a lot. And one of them was this one. And I don't know if this is there all over the world, whether you have this, but, but you throw a dice, you move along. And if you have a ladder, you can go all the way up it. But if you find a snake, you must go all the way down it. I had a sister. I have a sister. She is still three years younger than me. But when we were children, that three years made a big difference. So I could win at most games, but I could not win at this because I could not control the outcome. It was random. And I don't know about you, but there are elements of what's happened to all of us recently that feel like we hit a snake. It was random. We built this thing up and it's suddenly we're finding ourselves being pushed down here again. I want to draw a distinction because this, the ladder was also random. Now, of course, we can get some random luck in life, but we can also decide where we're going to put the ladder, what effort we will put into building the ladder, how big the ladder is going to be, and with what level of enthusiasm and commitment and heart and head we will go and climb that ladder. My third pillar today in terms of leading through uncertainty is that action is the antidote to anxiety. We have a lot of anxiety around in the world for good reason, but that is there to direct our attention. We must either act upon that direction or having put our attention there, as there is nothing we can do about it and shelve it and this takes mental discipline this takes real mental discipline for us the leaders but it takes even greater discipline for the people we are asking to walk alongside us down the path what can you do to help them take action because that is the antidote to activity and might almost sense the frustration saying, but our buildings are shut, what are you speaking about? Let me give you one example and see if it works for you. So one uh, business I worked with recently, right on the other end of the scale, was a restaurant group. They run around eight restaurants in the United Kingdom. All of their restaurants, of course, are shut. They are currently able to retain all of their staff. Their staff have anxiety, they don't know what to do. So. We decided between us what we would set was a series of ways of getting fitter, not physically, that's an option, but not where we're going with this, fitter for business. Because when we, we know that we will reopen and we know that when we reopen, there will need to be wonderful menus, better than the competition who've been asleep, more local produce being bought, better than the competition who've been asleep. We're going to have different activities for our children in the restaurants. We're going to understand search engine optimization so that when we come back, we're going to be fitter and better at the competition at our marketing, as well as the experience we're offering our people. What can you do, ladies and gents, to help your people act such that this community is fitter than it ever was when it comes out of this weird period? And that activity gives us purpose, 
belief and allows us to put the anxiety down, focus in a different area to make sure that when this does end, whatever we're facing, we're in super great shape to go face it. So action, action is the antidote to anxiety. Anxiety is there for a good reason and it deserves our full attention. But it does not require our obedience. We can override it, we can discount it, we can act, we can choose to shelve it. So that was the next pillar. Uh, and um, the one I want to speak next to is the idea of putting purpose above process. And, and let's come back to that, uh, that slide and look at that again. And I want to illustrate this, not with a story of anything I've encountered or my clients have, have taught me, but with a story of the All Blacks rugby team. The All Blacks, one of the most spectacular sporting stories and team stories that the world has ever seen, one of the greatest brands that the world has ever built on a commercial level, and they have a system which I was privileged to learn about. Now, imagine that you are playing whatever sport you play. There's it is rugby. Uh, and it's the last um, five minutes and you are losing. And you're the All Blacks. You don't lose. So you, in your head, you're thinking, I'm going to get this ball and I'm going to run through everybody and I'm going to score and I'm going to fix this, which, of course, is really useless thinking against a really professional world-class defence, which is being mounted by the opposition to stop you managing to equalize the score. And the All Blacks realized this was a problem, thinking correctly under pressure. So they devised a system, it's very simple. When they found themselves going in pressure, they were being red, they were getting aggressive, they were forgetting to cooperate and communicate, they were just gonna go in and, they call that red. When they wanted to come here, they call this thinking blue, strategy, communication, doing what you practiced, keeping it together, watching for a signal from the boss, which we all understand means that we're going to move in a certain direction. So they could speak to each other and just be blue. We as leaders have to be able to go blue. Because if we're receiving a call which is red, very emotional, but what if, but you don't understand, but so-and-so said, and the government says, and this, when speculation and rumour and gossip and anxiety, we have to be able to come back to process, a clear strategy, a clear plan, a clear set of actions, we know what we're doing, we know how to deliver, can we each as leaders pull this conversation back? which is really step two, isn't it? Because step one is our own ability to recognize when we become process and that we need to move into purpose. So when we ourselves are going red and we want to go over to blue. So I leave you with that uh, shorthand of how we, how we can negotiate this um, or how we can very quickly become aware of whether I'm blue or red in order to come back to blue. The second last point I'd like to leave you with is, is this idea, back to where I started really, that we have a limited time, our communities are looking at us, our children are looking at us, each of you is looking to each other for support in this extraordinary, peculiar time. So who is the captain, or what does that captain look like? How does that captain behave? That if you were in this environment, you would want to look down up from that, de that deck up to the wheel and see who do you want that man or woman to be? How do you want them to be acting? What do you want them to be saying? What do you want to see when you turn around and look up to see if it's all okay? So who do we need to be? And I'll leave you with this uh, penultimate idea on inspiration today, is that we need to be the captain we want to see ourselves at the wheel on the ship in stormy waters we can think about that tonight we can reflect on that we can ask our husband our wife our children 
um, uh, about that. We can ask our people about that. We can coach each other on that. And then we can be it. We can be it and make sure we're giving that leadership and that reassurance. And let me close then uh, by inviting you all to come, as we did in Budapest, free diving. And a free dive is just a, a, an extraordinary uh, voyage out of the comfort zone. And we've all been plunged out of our comfort zones. Uh, neither myself nor my amazing colleagues Maria and Thanasis, who are based in Greece, knew that we could, uh, working in different locations and via only Amazon, uh, deliver a green screen uh, experience to you all from a studio. We didn't know that uh, a week ago. We're all outside the comfort zone. This is in real time, so if you want to hold your breath, you've just missed the beginning, but don't worry, you've got time. Take a deep, deep breath and come with me. If you're sitting at home and you're on your own, please don't hold your breath if you feel weird. Just, uh, just take a breath, it'll be fine. There comes a moment in a free dive when we have to take a decision. It's right up there at the beginning of that dive. And the decision is, I am now going to 101 meters under the ocean. Unless there's an emergency, if there's an emergency, I'm going to come back very quickly quickly because this is not a macho sport and I love being alive and I love my family. It doesn't have to be dangerous. If there's no emergency, I have to know I'm going here. What I cannot do is decide at the beginning that I will go to 80% of the journey, to 80 meters out of my comfort zone. And when I get there, I'll stop and I'll reflect and I'll think, do I like it here or not? Does it feel okay? Do I want to carry on or shall I run home? Because if I invite my process to get involved in the conversation at 80 meters, it might well take over and drive me home again. At 80 meters, I'm under nine times the Earth's atmospheric pressure. It's one third of an atmosphere to go uh, to land in the aeroplane at the end of your holidays in those good old days uh, back at the airport. One third, I've just gone down to, uh, at 100 meters, 11 atmospheres, 33, 11 atmospheres, uh, 33 times that change in 60 seconds wearing a wetsuit, not in a pressurized tube. This means that my lungs get compressed down to the size of my clenched fists, that my, 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 uh, my diaphragm, the muscle that separates my stomach from my chest is sucked up into my chest cavity like the, uh, like the Duomo uh, in Florence. I have to know that's coming and that I've trained for it and that I'm pushing through it or I cannot possibly achieve the prize. Ladies and gentlemen, you uplift lives. You've built something extraordinary together. You own or manage, look after, inhabit, share some of the most beautiful architecture uh, on the planet and you provide an amazing experience that uplifts lives. What is the commitment you need to take at the beginning of this today, at the beginning of this dive, that means you will see this thing through to the other side of the comfort zone, and you will build with your people, the same people you're speaking with now, you'll carry them through, you'll uplift their lives and bring them to a place where they can deliver, because this period will end. And when it does, the way we acted during it will live on. Did we step up? Did we show up? Did we support the people who needed us to go through and deliver with us into the new environment, whatever shape that may take? So I leave you with these thoughts, uh, which is the summary of where we've gone today. Uh, I'll pass back to Simon uh, and I'll do so with uh, just huge affection. Thank you once again for. Um, inviting me back into the community. Thanks for coming into my home today this time. And maybe, uh, well, maybe forget it. Definitely looking forward to seeing you in one of your locations again uh, in this, the near, as near a future as I can make it. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for your insightful and as always energizing talk. We are all captains in this team. We all have our teams to lead. So I think this was very useful uh, today and a welcome digression or distraction from all the hard work that a lot of us are putting in uh, on a daily basis. Um, we are of course operating under a totally new set of circumstances 
But we have ideas, we have stamina, we have courage, and above all, we have enthusiastic colleagues. You know, the, the snakes and ladders bit. We have a lot of people in this team who are busy building ladders for the future of this company. Um, I'd like to give everybody the opportunity if they wish to switch on their cameras, because we're so used to seeing one another in our offices, in our hotels, and it would be nice if we could all see uh, one another. I think Adrian Sherry is trying to coordinate all this, and perhaps we can all see and look at one another and, and, and smile at one another, and above all, say thank you to you, Jim. Um, oh, no, no, thank you for the invitation. It was a great pleasure. It was wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and any questions? Um, there are lots of waving. I'm waving back. I've got you in grid view now. You're growing in numbers. It's wonderful. Um, any questions that you want to pass over, uh, either in chat? I don't know what our timing is. Simon will guide us. Uh, if I can't answer any question in chat, I'm, I'm happy to answer it um, back in email to everybody or, or, um, or via LinkedIn, um, uh, any, any way you wish. We have so many offices eh, around the world. Everybody's house is now our office as well. <laughs> Go ahead, guys. Anybody wants to say something? Even if it's not a question, share some thoughts. The floor is yours. I'm flipping through here. Uh, so uh, just as, as we uh, as we wait for any questions to come in um, from Keith, thank you. You're very welcome, uh, Michael, um, Joseph, Anna. Thank you. Thank you for your kind thanks. Uh, it was a great pleasure. Lovely to be here. Uh, we cannot speak as we are muted. Sorry, Joseph. That's not within my uh, command. Um, but you're welcome to type here. I don't know whether um, uh, the team are able to unmute anybody who wishes to speak. Again, Brian, thank you. It's a great pleasure, Helen. Great pleasure, Camilla. Um, uh, very kind, great pleasure. Very good. Let's keep it at that then. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much to everybody for joining and hope we can all meet up soon. We, we were meant to have our annual senior team meeting this year in Malta this summer. Of course, this is not going to happen uh, our, unless people want to swim here. Our airport is shut, so <laughs> unfortunately we're not going to be able to do that. But we'll be back soon, sooner than, sooner than perhaps... Uh, uh, one can imagine. Thank you very much, Jim, and thanks to everybody. And on behalf of all my colleagues, thank you again. See you all again soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.